hello. It is Alicia, uh, Reverend Alicia from Spirit of Unity Church, and Tish, who always wants to make an appearance at our book study. Tonight, we are studying our uh, Rise of the False Gods, and our topic tonight is Who or What Are False Gods? So um, I hope that you are excited about it tonight. When I do post this um, on YouTube, I hope you will click the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss anything. I also invite you to put your comments in as we go along. Ask questions. Uh, you know, let me know what you're thinking. I may or may not see your answers live right away, but I will see them uh, when the um, recording, when the video is over. So yesterday we looked at um, who or what is God. Now, did you have any thoughts about that? How did what I shared about my take, our teaching on false, on uh, God and who or what God is, how did that relate? Did certain things kind of speak to you? and say, oh, I never thought of it that way. And I, I hope you at least had a chance to kind of delve into it a little bit. Um, hang on a sec. I just wanted to uh, check out after the uh, group study last night, I realized I had questions that I hadn't or comments I had meant to discuss but didn't. I just want to make sure I didn't, uh, I didn't miss out on any of it. I think that... Uh, I think that I pretty much did. I want to make sure I underscore that uh, there is one God in unity. One of our foundational teachings is there is one presence and one power in the universe and in our lives, God, the good, omnipotent. And it doesn't matter. There's one God, yet there are many paths to get to that God. So, um, you know, and I also wanted to talk about, you know, God's loving nature, which I didn't do last night. And uh, I'll tell you about my dad. My dad is amazing. Uh, he's, he's living in heaven now with my mom, but there's no doubt in my mind he's in heaven. And if he's not in heaven, where he would be is probably right back here on planet Earth. Uh, working to help other people to uh, develop spiritually. But the one thing about my dad is he didn't go to church much. And I used to worry so much about him because, you know, it never made sense to me. My dad is just the nicest, kindest, uh, spiritual, without being religious, you know, person I ever knew. And... I so worried because he didn't show up at church. And one day I said to him, and I think I was an adult at the time, and I said, Daddy, um, you know, it's Sunday. You're supposed to go to church. You know, that's that's what it says, you know. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath. And he said, honey, he said, I can worship wherever I am. Well, and that was in my Catholic days, and I continued in my Catholic days for a while. So I still continued to worry about my dad and the fact that he didn't go to church. I am so glad I found unity because I learned that God does love us wherever we are, whether we're sitting in a church or whether we are not. And um, we're going to talk about this way down the road but um, there are many reasons why going to church is very beneficial. But that's not where we're going tonight. Tonight we're looking at who or what are false gods. Well, if God is absolute, eternal, unchanging, divine mind, um, all good. Because we always call God all good. Every form of good is a part of the nature of God. Therefore, everything that is not all good, all positive, all loving, all wisdom, all wise, that then would be 
a false God. It's a false God if we think for some reason it has worth or value in our lives. Um, now, if I say to you, uh, what is a false God? What images come to your mind? What do you think of? Do you think of like in those, those, uh, the movies like the, um, the Ten Commandments, remember that movie, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, where they make big, big statues of the scary and the fires in front of them and, you know, terrified me as a child. I watched the Ten Commandments and I, it took me a very long time to get over that. Uh, Ten Commandments is something else we'll be talking about in the future. But false gods, let's not take it from those scary images that we were given. They are every bit yet insidious, but they are not they. You see, false gods are states of consciousness. And we develop these consciousness as forms of perceived God, good. If God is good, I would say add another O to the word God and you've got good, okay? Therefore, a false God would be a belief, a false. So it's a state of mind. Uh, that we develop. It's a very human thing. And um, down the road, we're going to be talking about the four quadrants of consciousness, the higher being intuitive sensing and the lower being human thought and human emotion. Uh, a word that I like to use, it's not very popular these days, but it's carnal. Carnal means as a body of the flesh, of the lower nature, the base nature. So that's where the false gods live. They're the belief that we can manipulate our good, that we can cause things, uh, and that we need certain things. Let's look at the word worship. The word worship, uh, if you break it down to its root meanings, is worship. What do we give worth to? And if you want to know, what you give worth to, I'd like to ask you, what do you spend most of your time, energy, and money on, and why? Because whatever you give worth to is what you worship. Now that's scarier than one of those, those big statues of of false gods with the fires and the people running around and bowing down to them. Because if you are chasing after false good, you will not have your real good. I know this. I know it's true. How do I know it's true? Because I'm 75 years old and I have a lot of experience in thinking and, you know, worshiping, giving worth where it didn't belong. Now, there are two primary false gods in the Bible. One is called Baal, or the nature god. Tishy always has to give her two cents or so. She'll get over it in a bit. Uh, so one is Baal, which is the, the nature god, the, the, the lower common base. Uh, um, it's our, it's lust, it's all the physical things. And then ma mammon is materialism. It's stuff. Um, so those are the two primary false gods. But, you know, I wrote this book five years ago. And as I was preparing for our study group tonight, duh, I had a, a sudden realization. And it's one of those things, know it, but all of a sudden, there it is right in front of you. And that is that one of the most powerful false gods, the ultimate false god, would be self. So if, we're, if we worship our self, that's, that's, we're missing out on what life is all about. You know, it's like, it just, it just breaks my heart um, when I hear about things like a, um, 
uh, a 17, 15, 17, 17 year old was the youngest I heard, 17 year old girl getting um, augmentation uh, because she didn't feel she was, you know, developed to the point she wants. She was 17, you hadn't even fully grown yet, you know? If we're putting our appearance, if that appearance uh, is more important to us than who we are as a human being, then that is worshiping a false god. It's worshiping your own ego, your own error thoughts about what's really important. Mammon is about, you know, materialism and stuff stuff you own and stuff you want and putting a value on yourself or others or life based on your accumulated stuff, the quality of your stuff, the brand name of your stuff, um, you know, and, and showing off and look, there's nothing wrong with wanting to look your best. There's nothing wrong with liking new clothes, nice clothes, fashionable stuff, um, <laughs> which well, that wasn't one of my things. I'm like totally not a fashion plate, but I have my own stuff that I, my own false gods. We all have our own, but, but mammon is something that it's not only that you want to have more because you think uh, it makes you more wonderful or you already think you're more wonderful because you have more money and stuff than somebody else because it's that's not important at all. What we have is not important. Who we are is what is important. And if you are really, really prosperous, and this is something that, that really kind of gets on my nerves because even in Unity, we teach prosperity, Charles Fillmore, uh, his book, Prosperity, and uh, Eric Butterworth, his book, one of my favorites of all time, Spiritual Economics. Maybe one day we'll do a book study on that. But it doesn't talk about, you know, because they, it uses the word prosperity, a lot of times early on in my ministry, I thought if I taught a lot of prosperity classes, I would attract a lot of people. And I did. But if they didn't manifest, you know, immediate wealth, Okay, financial wealth, they thought it wasn't working. So if you worship, if you give worth to what you have, you are worshiping a false god. I'm not saying it's wrong to have stuff. I like stuff. Um, I don't like a lot of stuff because over the years, I have let go of stuff and let go of stuff. And you know what? I moved 20 I think 22 times in like, you know, 35 years. That's a lot of moving. Here's the amazing thing. In that 22 moves in 35 years, um, every time I moved, I got rid of stuff because I didn't want to drag it wherever I went. Oh, I dragged stuff around for a long time. And at one point you get like, I, I just don't drag this stuff around anymore. But every time I got rid of stuff, I got new stuff. I mean, I didn't like have to struggle or work. this is new stuff came to me. So uh, I'm not I'm not up for stuff. And in 2014, I moved from a lovely little um, townhouse out to my sister's campground where I helped them out my sister and brother in law's campground. When I did that, I got rid of I would say 75, 80% of my stuff. Most of the stuff you see around here, this couch, uh, a lot of the stuff that I have, my sister put in, she surprised me by, you know, preparing this lovely apartment for me to live on. It's two rooms and uh, I love it. And I am so happy here. Sometimes I see the fancy, fancy, uh, you know, mansions that people live in. And I think like, oh Lord, I'd never want to have to clean that. <laughs> you know, I don't clean that. I don't, I don't need to have stuff because if you got stuff, you got stuff, you got to dust, right? No. You are really prosperous when you're happy with what you have, no matter how much that is. Would I gripe and complain if I won the lottery tomorrow? I don't think so. 
But I'll tell you one thing I would do. I'd give a hey. That doesn't mean if you hear I won the lottery, don't be calling me for money because probably the money I'd be giving away would be to other churches and spiritual workers and, and all that kind of good stuff. Yes, it is freeing to clean stuff out. You feel like you're light and wonderful. And thank you for sharing that, Cheryl. My sister keeps saying she wonders what will happen if she ever moves because she has lived in her house for like 55 years. 55 years. And she's not a hoarder, but she's a saver. And she saves things because she does use it down the road sometimes and it's a nice little resource what would be the bad part of that is if she was so fearful about losing it and you know i feel sorry for the people that have to have that ring thing on the door because they're afraid if they um you know they got to see who's who's coming to their porch who's on it and then there's the people that have the the thing on their phone you know the little thing that'll monitor their ring on the doorknob so if they go away they're like they show them on an airplane and they're they're looking at their phone to see what's going on at the house because they're worried somebody's going to get their stuff no thank you there is a really really cute and this is off topic but very worth it if you go on youtube i'm sure you can find it there's a comedian who's no longer on the planet his name uh was george carlin and he's got a great, great, very funny uh, bit he does about stuff. And one of the funnest part is when you go into it, he says, my stuff is good stuff. Your stuff is junk. <laughs> one man's junk is another man's treasure. And that's true. Because if you looked around my house and you saw my treasures, well, I can look across the room and I can see one of those, uh, a lot of kids in, uh, yes, he was great. A lot of, a lot of kids in um, nursery school uh, would take a paper plate and pour plaster on it. Sometimes the plaster would be tinted and put their handprint in it. And then it gets hard and then they bring it home to mom and dad. You know, this is, I made this. Well, my daughter is 47 years old. So 45 years ago, uh, she brought me home one of those plaster plates. That's one of my treasure. Someday I keep threatening my children that I'm going to get out my treasure chest and uh, show them, you know, I'm going to make them watch everything that's in it. I'll do a video and I don't think they're that excited about it. And certainly there's nothing probably in there that they're going to want when I die. I don't know. Maybe... Uh, but I, there may be, you know, I've got those school papers and I've got my, my, uh, uh, my, what do you call it? Uh, uh, I took judo, so it's a gi, so it was the gi belt. And uh, I got a brown belt and they have my name written on it. And, you know, I wouldn't try it again today, but I did like judo back in then. And so I had, those are the things that are my treasures, you know. I always say if somebody broke into my house to steal my stuff, um, they'd probably leave stuff behind. <laughs> no feeling this woman needs some stuff. Uh, and actually, I was burglarized. I was burglarized twice. And it was very sad. And uh, But what I lost was the stuff that bothered me was very minimal, you know. I never had a whole lot of expensive stuff, but I've lost a lot of stuff. And God always gives it back. You see, if you keep thinking you got to hold on, that's false, false God. Because the real God, God as spirit, blesses us abundantly with every good thing. So all we have to do is just be kind, be generous, and be grateful for what we have and we will never be short of the very best stuff. And that may be a plaster of Paris plate with a child's handprint in it. That mine has a crack down the middle that I put back together with good old Elmer's glue. So what about your stuff? Do you have false gods you're worshiping in your life? Do you think? I had a false god that um, I don't know how I would qualify it. 
that false god was marriage, that I had to be married in order to have value. Now, I had a real and honest desire to uh, to be a wife and a mother and, and have a home. You know, I had a real desire for that. But the thing is, and some of you have heard me say this before, my desire to be married, I looked at it from the human level as if I was in control of that and I got married under the wrong circumstances to the wrong person. I did not want to wait. I always said I was one of those people that wasn't blessed with patience when God was handing out patience. I didn't have time to sit around and wait for it, so I left. Never got the patience. I work with it to this day, and I'm getting better. You know what's making me get better? Is knowing that actually God will provide everything I need. Man, that's a load off, isn't it? You know? So I invite you to trust, you know? Ego and power, which are also associated with the false god, that's Baal. Uh, that's the nature god. Um, and it, it, it's very hard to deal with because we have physical and human uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions, uh, our five senses, and they want to be satisfied and they want to be boss. And that can lead to circumstances in our life that we don't really want to live with. You got anything hanging in your closet that just doesn't fit anymore? You know, you got to put on those pants and all of a sudden you can't zip them up. <laughs> well, probably your body, which the old way of saying it is your flesh, is running you. You're not running it. See, I think we're here to, uh, of course, one of the things we're here to do, I've said it over and over, is to learn. And that we're here also to, what are we here to learn is to develop to being the spirit, the, the powerful spiritual being that is functioning in a human body, that we can be God-like. In unity, we call Jesus our way shower. He shows us the way. He came and he taught us. You know, if you're saving, if you're, you know, if you're praying for Jesus to come and fix something in your life, um, I invite you to sit down and ask yourself, well, what did Jesus teach about that? You know, what did he teach about, about taking care of yourself? I shared yesterday that I went to the uh, to the Tibetan store and it was full of Dalai Lama quotes. And that is a brilliant and powerful spiritual being. And there were books on how to deal with anger. Now, talk about putting yourself in as a false god. If we get angry at someone else, chances are that's Baal running our lives. Uh, you know, that that's that human part that wants to control others. You know, anger, this will get you. Have you been angry today? Anger is our frustration at our inability to make someone else do what we want. Anger is frustration at our inability to make someone else do what we want. Wow, think about that. We don't want to make our emotions a false god, do we? We don't want to make our appetite a false god. All that is false gods because ultimately they don't help you. They, they won't help you develop and become everything you were meant to be. You've got huge power. But if you're looking at the power being your own ability to control and manipulate instead of reaching out and learning how to be your best self, you're going to have a lot harder time getting there, you know? So, oh my goodness. So I do go on while I go off, don't I? Okay, so I want to try to get some of this done before we're done without taking up your whole night. Um, some people are so busy working and worshiping the false god mammon, which is money, materialism, and stuff, that they 
they put all their time in accumulating this stuff that they don't spend time with their family. Uh, you know, in, in my, back in my day, we had some really, really good music. I think every generation says that, you know, <clears throat> this generation's music is bad. Ours was good. But there was someone called um, Cat Stevens. I think he's the one that did it. And he did a song called Cats in the Cradle. And so if you know that one, go, yes, I know that one. Uh, Cats in the Cradle. Cats in the Cradle. In the, oh, God, I forgot. I know it. I would sing it if, if I didn't have to try to do it in front of anybody. But what it's about, it's about a father who is so busy doing his work and that he doesn't have time for his child. And he wakes up one day realizing his child is now on his own with his own children. And he calls his child on the phone to get together. And the son says, I can't right now, but we'll get together soon and we'll have a good time then. And that's, he realizes that's what he had told his child all his life. Our family is our greatest treasure. Do not forget that our family is our greatest treasure. We may not get along. There may be days we don't even like them. <laughs> but in our heart and soul, we always love them. So yes, yes, have a career, have a profession, do your best, accumulate some stuff, save some money for college and all that. But don't value the quality of your life based on that false god that is mammon. One of the biggest uh, issues with false gods is God. Yeah, God. That's when we say, well, my God is the real God. Oh, thank you. Yes, Cheryl is correcting me. That's a Harry Chapin song. Thank you for the correction. I never was one of those people that could remember that stuff. But let me tell you this. I actually went to, to uh, Harry Chapin's grave. I did. And now uh, uh, I went there. I have a picture of it. So one day I'll show it to you. Great singers. Powerful, soulful songs. Um, okay. So if we look at false gods as evil, okay, Oh, God, did I use a scary word, evil? What I mean when I say evil is backward. Evil, spelled backwards, is live. We don't want to live backward because we are meant to move forward as we grow. Don't fight over whose God is the right God, is the best God, is the true God. Because God is, okay? And we have had so many wars. If we think about all the, all the Jews that were killed during the Holocaust. Why? Because this person, this one person had a vision of a super race. And you know what? That's still going on today. Um, uh, in, uh, let's see, let me, I, got my, I, got, I got it in the book. In 1994, 1994 was not that long ago. 1994, they had the... Uh, Rwandan um, genocide where uh, millions of um, at least a million or more people were um, were were killed they were slaughtered um, because they were what was called Tutsis it was a certain um, a certain race uh, not, it wasn't even a race they were all the same race but it was a certain there were certain physical features they actually measured their noses and everything if you want to uh, get a look at that there's a very inspirational movie called um, uh, Rising from the Ashes. And it's an amazing and inspiring movie. It's got some tough parts, but this is what people do to people uh, in the name of the false god of personality, thinking that they or their race or their god is better than another one. When we confuse sex with power, that is a false god. Um, a lot of people, I, I, I'm sure anybody that's listening to this is so smart. They already know this. But rape is not about sex. It's about power. 
And if anyone has ever, you know, come in and molested you or tried to abuse you or has abused you, it wasn't about sex, but it was about power. It's an important thing to know. If you want to be more powerful than somebody, if you want to control somebody through power, that's a false god. Um, th so when, th when things happen, like right now we're in a great protesting period because of what's happening and Black Lives Matter and, and uh, the riots that are going on and the violence that is going on. This is where we really, really have to wake up to spiritual truth. Now, I, I really got, um, my goodness, I got uh, uh, dressed down by some very dear friends of mine when the first riots came out with George Floyd. And I had posted an article that said, please protest. Yes, protest. And then go home. If there is a curfew, go home. Because if you don't, you are feeding. You are feeding the people that want to call violence. The people that want to see it. And what's all that about? Power. And that is lower nature. The power of God is all good. Doesn't matter whether it's wearing a sari or a tunic or whatever. One presence, one power. I think, I mean, I would really like for you to have this book and read it because I just go off on toots when I'm doing this and get off track. But that is it for today. I didn't even know I had the energy to do this because I came in from work today and I was literally exhausted. And I did something I will probably regret. Um, I had a cup of coffee about an hour and a half ago. And I'm afraid when it's time to actually go to bed, I'm going to be like, yes, I'm not tired. <laughs> probably not the smartest thing I did. But I would rather stay awake too late at night because I drank the coffee and be able to uh, have our book study tonight um, than call it off because I was too tired. Your presence with me and your comments have energized me. I hope you've gotten something out of this evening's book study. And uh, now I'm going to be off for Friday and uh, for Saturday and Sunday. And we'll be back Monday. So guess what we're going to talk about Monday? False gods and the Antichrist. Does that scare you? Used to scare the pants off me. But... We're going to take a look at it. Take a deep breath and you probably won't be scared. And you'll have the courage to stand against it. God bless you. Have a great night. Thank you for sharing this time with me. You are a treasure in my life. Bye-bye.